This is a really historic moment, guys. This marks the first time in history Senate Republicans have tried to screw us over since the last time they've tried to screw us over. We've heard rumblings of lawmakers engaging in negotiations on a federal gun control package for a while now. We've seen headlines and stuff like that, but now we have a discussion draft released June 21st, 2022. Like many documents generated by government folk, it's an 80-page mess of cross-references, conforming amendments, and other crap. Feeling like my blood pressure wasn't quite high enough, I went ahead and read it. So let's take a look at the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act and see just what it contains. So we've heard that this is a piece of compromise legislation. As we know by common definition, a compromise is something reached by mutual concessions, a blending of the desires of two opposing views. With that, we should expect something like maybe deregulation of suppressors or short-barreled rifles in exchange for some gun control, perhaps. Or perhaps it's something else. I dug through this bill, and there's a lot in it. So let's just get straight to it. Title I of the bill sets up increased funding for states to develop and get certified community mental health clinics, followed by funds to set up more mental health stuff through telehealth and schools. Title II is regarding firearms, so this is where we should expect those compromises, right? Well, the first thing this title does is establish that anyone who committed a prohibiting offense loses their gun rights even if they were a child when it was committed. After all, everyone's character is the same as when they were 12, right? I mean, we don't like learn or grow or anything, so why bother? The exception is with involuntary commitment to a mental health facility, which would only permanently prohibit you from possessing firearms if it happened after you were 16. So if you act out really bad in middle school and the state puts you in a facility for a few days, you'll be fine. But high school? Nah, sorry. No rights for the rest of your life. If you're under 21, regardless of what you've done, it seems your background check will automatically be delayed until the FBI clears you. If they find something concerning in that three-day period, the FBI gets 10 days to check further into it. The section also requires state agencies to report these juvenile records to the NIC system, where previously many of the records of juveniles were reasonably sealed or private. So you have to understand this is about the three-day automatic proceed. They're basically getting rid of that for people under the age of 21. So that means they basically get 10 days to just muck around. The provisions requiring special background check procedures for people under 21 has a 10-year sunset provision being automatically repealed in 2032, but the juvenile records will stay in the system forever, and the provisions making juvenile felonies permanently prohibiting will also stay. To sum up the effects on people under 21, your transfers will take longer, the government has more information about you. For those under 18, your youthful indiscretion could permanently destroy your life. We talk a lot on this channel about the importance of procedures to restore rights for everyone, maybe who've reformed or really ne never did anything wrong to begin with. Well, on page 30 of this bill, the government wants to make it more onerous for states to do this. Remember, the feds won't restore your rights at all. This provision asks states to report to the feds what prohibiting records have been removed, why they were removed, and why that record was prohibiting originally. Now, why would they want that information? Surely not to collect it in some sort of database to prevent people from ever having their rights restored in the future, right? Moving on, the law redefines engaged in the business of dealing in firearms. This definition is relevant because somebody engaged in the business of firearms dealing either has an FFL or is a felon. So the current definition, which is somewhat rational, is somebody who deals in firearms with the principal objective of livelihood and profit. The definition proposed in this draft is now predominantly for pecuniary gain, which means the intent underlying the sale of firearms is one of profit. The definition goes on to state that the government does not need to prove profit if it accuses you of repeatedly buying and selling firearms for criminal purposes and terrorism. The important thing here is the way laws are interpreted. It's not terribly clear and thus the legislative history becomes relevant. 
under legal canons, the removal of old language focusing on repeated habitual transactions suggests that this new definition could target occasional or even single firearms transactions. It seems to me, under this new definition, one could be convicted of unlawfully dealing in firearms if they sold even one firearms just because they decided they could make a profit on it. If there's multiple transactions, remember that dealing without a license is a crime. And since proof is not required uh, of profit for repeated criminal transactions, it would be possible for the government to read the statute as to only need proof that multiple guns were sold to bring an offense. That's pretty damn concerning. Next up, the government establishes a system to use federal grants to incentivize states to install red flag laws. The provision has a lot of lip service to constitutional rights, but in literally every instance that is thrown out with wiggle words. For example, one of the big concerns of red flag laws is that the government doesn't have to give you an attorney at the hearings where they decide whether or not to strip your rights away. So here, the government says that to qualify for a grant, the state red flag law must provide that you have a right to be represented by counsel at no expense to the government. So, oh, no money? Sorry, you're on your own. Furthermore, after talking about the necessity of due process and standards of review, it states that the procedures must have the exact same standards and protections as civil court. You know, where a coin toss is enough. This is in contrast to criminal procedures where your rights are at stake, right? And the government must prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It also demands that state red flag laws to qualify for this federal funding have pre-deprivation hearings, meaning an opportunity to be heard before it takes your rights where required. <laughs> Again, wiggle words. It does precisely nothing to protect anything but paper companies given the amount of words they're using up here. So to sum up the red flag grant program, the feds want to provide a bunch of money to states to set up red flag laws as long as they pro promise to like totally respect your rights if it's convenient for them at the time. Further on, the bill includes the Stop Illegal Trafficking in Firearms Act, where already illegal straw sales are made super duper triple illegal and hyper expanded the definition with penalties of up to 25 years in federal prison. Personally, I like how the new penalty enhancements on gun sales are so expansive that the government felt the need to specify that it is not illegal to sell a gun to a licensed dealer. That's some, like, 80s drug war era lawmaking. <laughs> Christ. Moving on, lots of us remember the nightmare that was Operation Fast and Furious, where ATF armed a bunch of vicious drug cartels for literally no reason. On page 46, the bill makes it illegal for the government to sell guns to drug cartels unless the government promises to watch the guns after it sells them. Yeah. On page 47, the bill sets up a system where FFLs can use the wildly inconsistent and flawed Nix background check system, which doesn't tell you why it reached a result, by the way, to do background checks for employers who ask for them. Because that totally makes sense. The bill would also open the federal lost and stolen database for FFLs for the sole purpose of checking whether a gun they are buying has been stolen, which probably makes the most sense of anything we've seen so far in this bill. The bill spends a lot of money, like around page 50, where it devotes a million dollars per year for the ATF to come up with programs like harassing FFLs with, with more signs and stuff about straw purchases or whatever. We've all seen the like, don't lie for the other guy sign. If all this passes, I wonder if it'll be a, like some kind of a do I go to prison flowchart. <laughs> it also makes it so feds can reimburse local cops salaries if the local cops help feds enforce these laws, which is really something. But don't worry, page 51 contains a nice heartfelt promise that none of this stuff will be used to make a database of gun owners, which is whatever. Now, one of the big ticket items for, for them is what the anti-gun side has been calling the boyfriend loophole. Basically, the Lautenberg Amendments made it so misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence carry a lifetime firearm prohibition. The law basically limits that to cohabitating people. This law would change the definition of romantic partner into a total crapshoot, whose definition is literally, it depends. 
the factors that can be considered in whether or not you are a romantic partner of the alleged victim include the length and nature of your relationship and how frequently you interacted with that person. So yeah, it does nothing to tell us what a domestic partner is for the purpose of this law, but it does have a little section clarifying that your casual workplace buddies are not domestic partners. As for one night stands, who knows? Now, having a misdemeanor crime come with lifetime loss of civil rights is completely unusual and probably unconstitutional. And the government seems to know this because on page 54, the draft bill sets up relief for someone with only one conviction of this to get their rights back after five years. It then goes on to make exceptions to that exception where any further misdemeanor will permanently take your rights away. And also, if the victim was basically anyone the law covered anyway, you can never get your rights back. So it's another nothing masquerading as a softened blow. Quite a compromise. Title III spends a lot of time talking about spending boatloads of money in setting up a repository of evidence-backed school safety measures. Of course, because we're also concerned about schools for some reason, despite, you know, the probability of harm there being unbelievably low. <laughs> $100 dollars is set aside for Nick's employee salaries, another couple billion for federal DOJ grants, um, a metric boatload of money to put more cops on school campuses, you know, to convert more kids into hardened criminals and make schools look even more like prisons. I then got to the last page of the bill and I read it again. At this point, I was deeply confused because I couldn't find any compromises from the anti-gun side. I looked and I looked and I couldn't find any NFA reform. I couldn't find any relief from the preposterous abuses that we've suffered for all these years. I, I couldn't find any compensation to the victims of a violent, out of control state. All I found in this whole document was ill-reasoned restrictions on the right to arms, an expansion of peaceable conduct that could see you locked in a federal cage, naked discrimination against young adults, and many billions of dollars being moved around. Maybe it was some kind of mistake and it'll be fixed in the next version. Or maybe the two-party system is a hilarious failure and the government doesn't care about your bodily autonomy or your rights. I don't know. Anyway, I'll see you later.